Are Super Earths the missing link for Elon Musk and an interplanetary species dream? From the company's outset, SpaceX founder and CEO Elon Musk has remained focused on his vision for a new human civilization outside of Earth's atmosphere. After the Pioneer outfit launched its Crew-2 mission into orbit, Musk was quoted as saying, We don't want to be one of those single-planet species. We want to be a multi-planet species. Could two new discoveries in solar systems outside our own be the key to realizing Musk's vision? While the South African billionaire's main focus has always been establishing a permanent human presence on Mars, building up a habitat suitable for human life would require extensive work from multiple sectors and would pose a formidable challenge. Think urban construction, but on a massive and unprecedented scale. The technical issues, including raw material development, as well as the construction and maintenance of the required technology, must be addressed before Musk's dream of human inhabitation can become a reality. Mars is only one planet over from us. Why does it require so much work? The current scientific consensus is that, like Earth, Mars once had a magnetic field that protected its atmosphere, roughly 4.2 billion years ago. This planet's magnetic field suddenly disappeared, which caused Mars's atmosphere to slowly be lost to space. Over the course of the subsequent 500 million years, Mars went from being a much warmer environment containing water to the cold, arid place we all know today. A study from 2021 suggests that a lot of the natural resources needed to create the type of survivability infrastructure necessary for humans may already be in place on Mars itself, which would be a monumental step towards achieving regular trips to the Red Planet. However, while scientists remain interested in planets beyond our solar system, which may already provide a suitable environment to sustain life, we wonder whether a habitat for Earth's natives, without the need for these kinds of difficult and expensive adaptability projects, is already out there. So what exactly are super-Earths, and why have scientists become so enamored with them in recent days? Just a couple of days ago, astronomers found two celestial bodies known as mini-Neptunes in star systems dubbed TOI-560 and HD-63433. So-called mini-Neptunes, which are made up of large, rocky cores surrounded by thick gas, are smaller versions of their namesake in our own solar system. Mini-Neptunes are one of two types of commonly seen exoplanets, that is, a planet found outside our solar system that falls into the category of being smaller, rocky worlds which orbit close to their stars. The other is super-Earths, which are commonly as large as 1.75 times the size of our planet, while mini-Neptunes tend to be between two and four times the size of Earth. The observational study's findings suggest that atmospheric gas is escaping from two of these planets, leading scientists to believe it is likely that these mini-Neptunes are actually turning into super-Earths. Michael Zhang, lead author for both studies, has said that while most astronomers suspected that young, small mini-Neptunes must have evaporating atmospheres, nobody had ever caught one in the process of doing so until now. Why does Earth's atmosphere not simply drift into space in this way? Simply put, Earth's gravity is strong enough to hold onto its atmosphere and prevent solar winds from displacing it due to its relative size. Mars, for example, is less than half of Earth's size and around one-tenth Earth's mass, and less mass means less gravitational pull. Mars's atmosphere is only about one one-hundredth as dense as Earth's today. Picture a tower of acrobats, each standing upon the shoulders of another. Like the acrobat at the bottom, the air at the bottom of the atmosphere is under a lot more weight than the air nearer the top. That means the air nearer Earth's surface is squashed by the air above it and is thus denser. The higher you go in the atmosphere, the thinner the air becomes. 
99% of the air is contained within the 19 miles closest to the surface. Yes, that's right. The Earth's atmosphere has weight. So down here on the surface, at the bottom of the tower, we have about 14.7 pounds of air pressing down on every inch of our bodies at all times. Fortunately, we can handle it. Since we evolved down here, our bodies are perfectly calibrated to withstand that amount of pressure. Of course, higher in the atmosphere, we begin to experience difficulty. Even at around 10,000 feet altitude, the air becomes thin enough that most people have trouble getting sufficient oxygen. This presents a common problem for mountain climbers and, less frequently, airplane travelers when asked to affix a mask around their nose and mouth. To use an extreme example, if the Earth was the size of a soccer ball, the breathable atmosphere would be thinner than an A4 sheet of paper. Seeing our atmosphere from space shows how thin and fragile it is. And as American planetary scientist Carl Sagan put it in his book, Billions and Billions, many astronauts have reported seeing that delicate thin blue aura at the horizon of the day lift hemisphere. That represents the thickness of the entire atmosphere and immediately unbidden contemplating its fragility and vulnerability. They worry about it. They have reason to worry. The keen listeners among you will be wondering, if a planet keeping its livable atmosphere depends on its size, why are many Neptunes losing theirs despite being twice the size of Earth? Many Neptunes are classified as gas dwarfs and possess a thick oxygen helium atmosphere probably with deep layers of ice, rock, or liquid oceans. And it's the hydrogen in the atmosphere that is subject to absorption by the sun. Smaller gas planets and planets closer to their star will lose atmospheric mass more quickly via a process called hydrodynamic escape. As molecules are heated, they expand upwards and are further accelerated until they reach what's known as escape velocity. The Neptune in our solar system, and even the Earth we inhabit, are subject to this same process, albeit more slowly than the gas dwarfs. So why does Carl Sagan think we should be worried? Well, scientists estimate that in one billion years, the Sun will be 10% brighter than it is now, making it hot enough for Earth to lose enough hydrogen to space to cause it to lose all of its water. So the question remains, can humans expect to survive migration to a super-Earth outside of our solar system? Putting aside current technological travel constraints for a moment, there are still a number of issues that may prevent us from calling a new planet home. Let's start with gravity. Picture again the acrobat at the bottom of the human tower. Let's imagine that one person standing on that acrobat's shoulders is Earth's gravitational magnitude. If a human were to stand on a super-Earth, which is twice the size of our home planet, that human tower would now stand three people high, with the acrobat at the bottom bearing twice the weight. In real terms, inhabiting a gravitational field that is too strong for a human to adapt could have disastrous consequences, like our blood being pulled down into our legs and our bones breaking from the extreme force. Needless to say, Finding the safe limit is probably an exercise best done before landing on a prospective new forever home. Conversely, any planet we could deem as the next chapter in the history of our species would need to be large enough to avoid rapid atmospheric evaporation, which could have equally disastrous results while maintaining a hospitable distance from its star. Do the newly discovered fledgling super-Earths fit the bill? Again, let's begin with gravity. To work out the largest gravitational force a human could function in, a University of Zagreb study, led by Nikola Poljak, first calculated the comprehensive strength of a human bone. Based on an average mammal bone, they estimated that a human skeleton could support a gravitational force more than 90 times Earth's gravity. This figure, however, only accounts for a stationary position. Once we start running, the stress on our bones increases by a factor of 10, meaning you could run on a planet with a gravitational field roughly 10 times that of Earth's before your bones started to crack. And it doesn't end there. 
As skeletal strength is only a fraction of the equation, Poljak calculated that at five times Earth's gravity, even an elite athlete could not stand up from a seated position. For a human weighing 110 pounds, the mere act of getting up off their chair would feel like squatting 320 pounds. For the maximum gravity at which we could take a step, the team examined Icelandic strongman Hapvor Hulius Bjornsson, who you may recognize as Sir Gregor, the Mountain Clegane, from the Game of Thrones TV series, who once walked five steps with a 1,430-pound log on his back in a record-breaking feat of human strength. Based on Bjornsson's weight of the log, the study estimated that the strongman would still be able to take a few steps in a gravitational field around 4.6 times greater than our own. But of course, Bjornsson isn't your average human. At 6 foot 9 inches and weighing in at more than 400 pounds, he is far from an ideal sample of our species' capabilities in the unknown terrains of outer space. For you and I, Paul Jack and his colleagues estimated that aiming for an exoplanet with three times Earth's gravity would be more realistic, and we would still need rigorous training to get muscle strength up to that of an elite athlete. Of course, it is difficult to garner exact data about the gravitational strength of a planet without going there. However, volume increases as a cube and surface area as a square, so even a slightly bigger planet would have much stronger gravity. This means that our acrobat is more likely to be balancing the weight of two people and their weekly groceries on a planet twice the size of Earth. So while we don't yet know how large the new discoveries will be after they emerge from their Neptunic cocoons, Michael Zhang and his team believe that they will manage to hold on to their hydrogen atmospheres for some time. This, in theory, means that these super-Earths may one day develop into a suitable home to support life. Unfortunately for you and I, sun-like stars have particularly short pre-main sequence phases. A pre-main sequence phase is the stage of a star's life, wherein it has acquired nearly all of its mass, but has not yet started burning hydrogen. This phase is typically around 50 million years, which isn't enough time to yield sufficient oxygen to create true Earth-like environments. This was true of our own solar system too. Shortly after its formation, Earth's atmosphere contained mostly nitrogen and carbon dioxide, a fact that only changed roughly two billion years ago, thanks to the development of a life form called cyanobacteria, which converts carbon dioxide to oxygen. And over the course of some 10 million years, Oxygen succeeded carbon dioxide as the second most prevalent component of Earth's air, after nitrogen. Trusty oxygen now makes up roughly 20% of Earth's atmosphere. What does this mean? It means we're looking at a probable 10 million year wait for our new friends to be ready to accept us, if they ever will be. However, each new discovery of super-Earths and exoplanets like them offers new hope for the longevity of our species, where before there was none. The destruction of the Earth is an inevitability, one that we can only slow down to give future generations of human beings the best possible chance of a fresh start on a planet you and I may not even know about, no matter how far-fetched it may sound to us in the here and now. In the meantime, Mr. Musk's dream of human colonies on Mars may provide a necessary layover destination in our quest for another home.